Let's open up our Bibles to chapter 8 of Romans. Man, oh man, has it been rich or what? Chapter 8. You know, there was two football players that were taking an important final exam. And you know, it's kind of a stereotype, but it's kind of true, I guess, in some ways. You know, they're not usually not the brightest athletes, right? Right, Greg? Okay, okay. Greg's a coach. And there was going to be an academic problem with these guys, and they weren't going to be allowed to play in the Sugar Bowl the following week. And so exam was, you know, it was really easy. It was dumbed down. It was just fill in the blanks kind of a thing. And the last question said, look, just to make these guys be able to play, here's the last question. Old McDonald had a, well, yeah, right? Well, Bubba, one of the guys, he was stumped over that question. He had no idea of the answer, and he knew that he needed to get this one right and be sure that he passed. And making sure the professor wasn't watching, he tapped Tiny, the other football player, on the shoulder, and he said, psst, psst, hey, Tiny, what's the answer to that last question? And Tiny just laughed his head off. He says, man... He looked around to make sure the professor wasn't, hadn't noticed, and he turns to Bubba. Bubba, you are so stupid. Everybody knows that old McDonald had a farm. And, oh, yeah, said Bubba. You know, I remember now. And so he picked up his number two pencil, and he started to write the answer in the blank, and then he stopped. And he reaching to tap Tiny's shoulder again, and, and he whispered, Tiny, how do you spell farm? Tiny just could not believe it. He says, Bubba, you are so dumb. That's so easy. Farm is spelled (laughs) E-I-E-I-O. Oh, man, don't you love stereotypes? Sometimes they're, they're, you know, they're just hilarious. There are certain things that we don't know, right? We don't know, for an example, how a honeybee can fly. You see, theoretically, the wings of a honeybee are too short. They are too light to support him when he's carrying pollen. It's actually an aerodynamic impossibility for a honeybee to fly when he's loaded down with pollen. But guess what? Them honeybees fly when they're loaded down with pollen. Certain things we don't know. Things as simple as the flight of a bee. And then there are some things that we truly do know. We do know. And um, we know the promise that is given to us. You can stop that honeybee, buddy, anytime. (laughs) Over here, guys. You know, okay. There are some things we truly do know. It is amazing to watch that bee, though, isn't it? I've been watching my hummingbirds. We got these two feeders now. I've learned a couple things about uh, hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are actually supposedly lighter than a nickel. If you you put a nickel on a thing and a hummingbird, I guess you'd have to kill them first. (laughs) Put them in there. He wouldn't stay. You'd go. Uh, But if we could, you know, do that, they would be actually lighter than a nickel. Isn't that amazing? And the other thing I've learned about hummingbirds is they are, they are very mean. Uh, they, they are mean to each other. Boy, they're territorial and go fighting. But that's off the subject. The promise that we should know today is right in Romans 8.28. Let's read that together. <clears throat> and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Oh man, in our text, notice this. Paul doesn't say, you should know that all things work together for good, does he? He doesn't say, I want you to know that all things work together for good, but he says, you already know it. It's an assumption. You already know that. You already know that all things work together for good for them or to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. 
So how did they know that? How did they know that they didn't even have Romans 8.28 yet? How did they know that? Paul, Paul could assume that they knew this truth because they knew Jesus. They knew that price that was paid for them. Look at verse 32 down there on the page. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? In between all and things, there is an assumption that it's good, right? It's from a good God. All good things, okay? And so, if he loved you enough to send his son to die for you and be slaughtered in your stead on the cross for your sins, don't you know that God will do whatever is good for you? Whatever is good for you always. And that's the reason why he could say, and we know that all things work together for good. When I begin to doubt the love of God, <laughs> or if I wonder you know, whether things in my life are really working together for good, all I need to do is look back at Calvary. Look at that cross of Jesus Christ. They're dying for me. And another reason is that there is a peace within me. Uh, remember Genesis chapter 42, and it's the story. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to talk about it. But it's the story about Joseph, of course. Good example of all things working together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. And yet, uh, Joseph is a great model for us because really, honestly, you know, it doesn't ever say that he really stumbled over what his brothers had done against him. Remember the story? Jacob had, uh, was extremely loved. Jacob loved all of his 12 sons, although his one son, Joseph, was really special to him. And he gave him a special garment to wear. Uh, some say it was of multicolors. But really, when you go into the, uh, into the original meaning, it means that he had long sleeves or large sleeves, and that was a sign of authority, that that long sleeve garment was given to one man to have authority over the other. And um, Joseph's robe made his brothers so jealous that they threw him into a pit where they were going to leave him to die. And then one of the brothers suggested they could make a little bit of money on the side if they, you know, sold him as a slave. And so sell them, they, they, they did. And uh, after they kind of uh, dummied up the scene and smeared some blood on his uh, garment, on his coat, and brought it over to their dad and said, hey, Joseph was eaten by wild animals. And um, so it caused great grief to Jacob Meanwhile, in an incredible series of events, it just seems like it got worse and worse and worse. Joseph became, uh, you know, imprisoned and all of these things. He, but God was with him the whole time, wasn't he? Even with that false accusation where he became like kind of a servant in, in the house of, of Potiphar and his wife went after him because he was a good looking guy. And um, she went after him to seduce him, and he wouldn't have nothing to do with it. He was, his, he was kept a pure heart, and matter of fact, tried to avoid her, and she just ripped the robe right off of him as she said, come to bed with me, and all this stuff. And yet, she falsely accused him because, you know, she kind of deflated her ego because he didn't want anything to do with her. And um, so she accused him falsely of, of uh, adultery. And so he was back in prison again. It must have been a tremendous, uh, you know, pressure upon Joseph not to believe that his life was working out for good, that his circumstances just seemed to be getting worse and worse. But eventually, eventually, God had raised him up to that position through many, you know, the story where he became the number two man in all of Egypt, only under the Pharaoh uh, was there greater authority. And famine hit Israel. And uh, Jacob called his sons together and said, verse 42, uh, chapter 42, 2, he said, he continued to, I have heard that there is a grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. 
And so his sons, ten in number, appeared before the prime minister, whom they did not recognize anymore. Joseph is older now. Joseph is also looking totally Egyptian, you know, with the shaved head and the little ponytail and all that kind of stuff that we've seen in movies. And he said, why are you here? Joseph knew who they were, but he was playing coy, right? He was trying to test his brothers. And they said, we're here to buy grain, your highness. And so he tested him and said, I think you're lying. I think you're spying out the land. And his brothers insisted, no, 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 we're brothers. In fact, there were 12 of us originally, but only one of our brothers is dead, and our youngest brother is still at home. And so Joseph, again, testing them and drawing them out, said, well, if that's true, then go get your youngest brother and bring him to me, and that will validate your story. But meanwhile, Simeon, you're staying here in, in jail until the uh, others get back. And so the nine went back now without Simeon, taking the grain that Joseph had given them. And meanwhile, circumstances got worse. The famine got worse. And they needed that to continue on with that plan that God had to purpose good things in the end, even though things seemed terrible. And so as that famine grew worse, soon they were out of food once more. And Jacob tells his sons, go back, go back again. And um, verse, 40, uh, verse 33 and 34 says, Then the man who is Lord over the land said to us, This is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me and take food for your starving households and go. But bring your youngest brother to me so I will know that you are not spies but honest men. And then I will give your brother back to you and you can trade in the land. And so their father Jacob, and here's the point, said to them, you have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Look what he said. Everything is against me. This is Jacob. This is really Israel, right? Ruled over by God. He was given that name. But here he's acting like a Jacob, thinking in the flesh, and he thinks, man, oh man, everything is against me. But what does Romans 8 say? No, everything or all things work together for good. And so what is Jacob declaring? He's saying, you know, everything is working against me. My son Simeon is a hostage. My son Joseph was slaughtered by some wild animal. And now my son Benjamin, my, my son that I, I love so much now in place of Joseph is now uh, going to disappear. <laughs> Everything is against me. But Joseph was, I mean, Jacob was really wrong, wasn't he? He was completely wrong about certain things. He did not have all the facts. He could not have all the facts. He doesn't see the future. He doesn't know what God is going to do, does he? Guys, we're in that same space. We're living in circumstances that are troublous at times can be extremely troublous. And God is calling us out to believe that he is a good God, that he has a good purpose, that he will work all things together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. But we're called to faith, you see. Jake, uh, uh, Jacob here is failing in his faith. He was wrong about what was going to happen. Jake, uh, uh, Benjamin would return and Simeon would be released. And guess what? He's even going to get back that son that he thought he lost, Joseph. So the story continues. The brothers return to Egypt and they appear before Joseph with Benjamin in tow. I'm the brother you put into the pit, the one you sold into slavery, announced Joseph to them. And the brothers fell at his feet in fear of revenge. Don't be afraid, Joseph said in verse 20. He says, you intended to harm me, or you intended it for evil. But God intended it for good, notice, to accomplish what is now being done. What was now being done? The, is, the Israelites were being cared for in a time when everybody was starving. 
that the, that the lineage of Israel, the Messiah, would, would come forth. This is all about you and me and about our Savior, of us being born again and knowing God and having a personal relationship, about our sins being saved. It goes back to this story. Because if God hadn't worked out all this famine for good and all of the circumstances they were going through through Joseph's tragedies, Guys, none of us would know Christ today. And so he's saying, you know, to accomplish now what is being done, the saving of many lives, God intended it for good. And so Joseph said, everything you did to me was part of a plan. And that's where we are, guys, aren't we? We realize that God, and this is the, one of the most exciting things for me personally, is the creator of this universe, it's amazing to think about it, has a plan for me. I mean, I'm just amazed to be even to be led into the, you know, have any kind of forgiveness at all, you know, in my life. But he actually has a plan for my life. And this is the good God. That his, his will is always perfect and wonderful and good and fulfilling. And so I've learned more and more as I get older honestly, as I get older and older, I just get so much more convinced that God's will for me is the best thing I could ask for. God's plan for me would be the best thing. And so how are we? This is our application right now on this verse. How are we? How do we act and how do we react to difficulties in our lives? Some of us are so negative, aren't we? Some of us are so negative. We're like Jacob. We, we just go right to everything's working against me. Everything's against me. There is no plan. We are not even thinking of God's plan. We're just thinking about our, our own uncomfortableness. We're just thinking selfishly over what's going on. How can this be happening to me, we think, you know? And we're in a bad mood and we have a negative overtone to everything going on in our life. Some of us are that way. Or are we like Joseph saying, man may have meant this for evil in my life or to harm me, but God meant it for good in my life. <laughs> I think sometimes I'm a little bit too close to Jacob in these matters. I like to sometimes, and this is my flesh is extremely ugly. How's yours? <laughs> We love to exhibit, you know, oh, you know, this kind of a downtrodden face so that every, people will feel sorry or sympathy for us, you know. What is it about our flesh that wants people to think that we have it harder than anybody else, you know? I get to question God's goodness. I get to question God's plan for my life. It's really, really not good, you know. Who am I going to be? What am, I, am I going to be a self-indulgent person towards, my, uh, towards things in my life and, and, uh, and cast God in a bad light and have a bad testimony, even though I know, as Paul said, we all know in our heart that promise that is given to us because of the price that was paid for me, because of his wonderful love and that peace available for me, that all things work together for good, my friend. Why? Because for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose or might, might want to put the word plan, his plan for your life, you see. We can have our own plan. And when we're running our own life and we have our own little uh, schematic of how we intend to live our lives and how we want our lives to be, expect that to be ruined. Expect it to be ruined. This world will ruin it. The devil will ruin it. And, and if God is not in it, it will not, be, it will not uh, keep going. It will let you down. Righteous and true are his judgments, Psalm 19.9. And so whatever he does will always prove to be excellent. And I'll stand on that. God has everything working out according to his good will. 
Look what it says in verse 29 now as we go on. <clears throat> you see, all things work together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose, right? Why? Because God has a plan and he has predestined a plan for your life. Notice he says, for God foreknew for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Guys, that is a powerful statement. It's almost one where we can just read it and not even get anything out of it. What, is all, what do these things mean? For God foreknew. You see, God is omniscient. He knows all things, right? Right? There's nothing that can be added to his memory. I surprise myself, but I don't surprise God. He already knows what I would do and what I would do and what I would do and what I would do. He knows everything about me, my past, my present, and guys, he knows my future. Now, I like that fact because one of the great truths about that is I'm never going to surprise God. Matter of fact, I don't even disappoint him in the sense of, you know, uh, like, oh, no, I don't believe you did that, Butera. You know, it, it'll never come to that where I shock God. You know, he already knows and he's already accounted for all of my blunders and my stupidity and my sin and all the r rotten things that I might think or do. He's accounted of that perfectly because his intellect is such that he knows all things but this word for new actually goes way back to infinity that in the in infinity past god has always known me he's always known me he foreknew me and he knew what i would do and that i would get sick and tired of living in darkness and that i would desire the light in my uh, in my walk with the lord he knew me he foreknew me and that's what has happened with every one of you for those that god foreknew god has always known you yet we can trace back now as we look back those of us that know the lord here we look back and we say, oh, I see how God was working in my life. How about you? I see how old back then here was one of these major, major uh, uh, spotlights in my life, making me and twisting me and turning me towards God. And even these horrible, dark times that came down in my life. Oh, that was another one of those things driving me to know Jesus, to be sick and tired of darkness and desiring the light of Christ in my life. And so he says, you know, for those that God foreknew, he also predestined to be what? Conformed. What does that mean? Okay, wait, wait. Predestined means that there is a plan way before you ever existed, a plan for your life predestination okay based upon what foreknowledge based upon what in this is where you're going to get this whole like calvinists like to just stay with just the predestination part never account for choice but this was again foreknowledge according to foreknowledge of what we would choose and the choices that we would make that god elected us to be his child and he foreordained or he uh, uh, preordained and predestined our lives to be what? Conformed into the image or the likeness of his son. He predestined our life. You know what our, you know what our, our final destination is, guys? I know it's heaven, but you know what our final destination is as people? You know what we're really going to be like? You know what you're, you know, everybody's got different personalities, but do you know what character we're really all going to be like? Jesus. And there's nothing you can do to stop it if you're born again. There's nothing you can do to stop it. God has, has a predestined plan to make you and to conform you, to change you into the likeness of his son, the character 
of Jesus. And isn't that a wonderful plan? So we have to remember that as we go through tough things, as we go through pressures, as we go through suffering, that these things bring about perseverance, and perseverance brings around character. What is that character? The character of Jesus. That we learn to no longer trust in ourselves and in our flesh, but we learn to trust moment by moment in the living God who has a plan for us. And we want to trust him in those things. Oh, guys, for God, those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Hey, guys, you know what? If you knew that the person next to you tomorrow, Monday, was going to inherit a billion dollars, that that's the person right next to you, you think you'd be a little bit nicer to them? You think a little bit nicer to them if you knew that? Guys, that person next to you, that person next to you is going to inherit the riches of Christ. Far more than any billion dollars or anything like that. That's what we are going to inherit. Oh, what great, how we should be towards other, uh, each other, how we should love one another is amazing to us. Oh man, that we are brothers, firstborn among many brothers. And so that's the desire. God wants us to be his children. And that's that plan uh, from all eternity past. He is predestined based upon his foreknowledge of, of our choices also that he has predestined our life to be conformed or changed into the image of his son Jesus so that Jesus might be the firstborn of many children of God. Do you understand? Oh, look at guys what he says there. Then what shall we say? Oh, no, let's keep going. I, I, I messed up. Here, we can't forget this part. In those he predestined, he also called. And so here's the order. God predestined us, you know, according to his foreknowledge, he, pre he predestined us. And at some time in our life, uh, well, God already, he called us, but it may have come through perhaps someone preaching to us or a book or however it might have happened that we heard the gospel going to church or just a friend who had a burden for us and the Holy Spirit was working in our life bringing us to that place of decision in our life and showing us our need uh, for salvation. And he says, those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, as we accepted Christ and became a child of God, he also justified. Remember, we talked about that. Justified, that word that means just as if I'd just as if I'd justified, just as if I'd never sinned at all. Guys, you get that? It's not just being forgiven. You don't get justification from just being forgiven. It's beyond that. Forgiveness is, okay, I'm letting you off the hook for everything, but you still did all those things, right? But you're not getting punished for it. That's forgiveness. No, justification means, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you've never done it. There's no even not any guilt or any stain or tarnish. It never existed as far as God is concerned, and that's how he sees you. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus. Oh, guys, after we are justified, we were also, he also glorified. Notice that word is in the past tense. We often think about the glorification that's spoken about uh, in Romans, about our bodies, you know, our new bodies that will given, be given to us, and that certainly is a glorification. But guys, actually, the glorification began the moment you were, you were born again. The moment you, were, moment you were born again. I don't know what that glorification is, really, honestly, other than, you know, God... His angels glorying as he looks at us and says, God, you're, you did that in, in Mike? That guy? 
I still get that when we do our little concerts and stuff because I get a bunch of guys from my past that knew me in music and everything. And then they find out I'm a pastor. They say, Mike? <laughs> and hopefully I'll be glorified, not in my anything to do with me, but God will be getting the glory through that glorification that comes in my life when they say, wow, something has happened in his life. He's not the same man. He really has met God. God really has done something in him. Oh, guys, we are being glorified. And then he says, what then shall we say in response to this? <laughs> well, you got anything? <laughs> it's almost like Paul's just kind of saying, man, get your head around this. And it just it's just so amazing that there's really not words to put into it. What God has given to us in Christ Jesus. All things work together for good for those who love God. For those who are called according to his purpose. Oh man, he's done so much. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the likeness of his son. That he might be firstborn among many brothers. Guys, God has got a plan for your life. And that plan cannot be thwarted. Because God is sovereign, and he rules. And I love that. Because I don't need to worry. Am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? Oh, man, I really did wrong. You know, I didn't have a great week this week. And, oh, I don't know how my performance has been or whatever. Or, or what if I stumble or what if I fall, you know? Oh, man. Jesus said, you're in my Father's hands and no one can snatch you from my Father's hands. All who come to me, I will no wise cast you out. He who began a good work in you will bring it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Oh, guys, God started a plan in our life from the beginning of time, and he's foreordained that we would be in this place right now and we're all in that place of being shaped and molded and conformed just like clay to the potter's hand clay being made into the spiritual image of his son so that we might be children of God what we're going through today guys what we're going through in our lives is shaping us for all of eternity in heaven that beautiful character Guys, we're not going to be a bunch of automatons up there. We're not going to be a bunch of rubber-stamped people up there that we all, you know, talk the same and, you know what I mean? Have, we just like right now, we are infinitely different from each other. And yet we have that common spirit, the spirit of God in us, the common Savior, our same Father in heaven. We will be like that, that individuality even though we are all conformed to the same likeness. Do you get it? Oh, it's such a beautiful thing that God is in store for us. So everything that's going on in your life, my friend, everything, all circumstances, are working together because God has a plan. They're working together, not for evil. They may become evil things you're going to see evil things you're going to see times of evil paul talked about we need to be prepared for those we need to have the whole armor of god on but the end result just as jacob could not see it he could not know it we need to be trusting where he did not trust instead of saying all things are against me hey man Paul is saying everything is for you. You kidding? Look what he says here. <laughs> what shall we say in response for this? If God is for us, who can be against us? It's the exact polar opposite of what Jacob said. If God, think about it. If God is for you, who can be against you? You know what a ringer is? Like if you're playing a sport or something and, you know, uh, I, I, I've had a couple instances where I've had a ringer uh, come in uh, and we've had like uh, maybe in some sports competitions like basketball, which I really am terrible at. Um, 
you know, I've got somebody like Greg or somebody coming in to, to play, you know, and I know this guy's just going to pounce everybody. I know I'm going to win because he's on my team. They don't know it. But I know it because I got this guy on my team. And, and it's like that. God, if God is for us, guys, who can be against us? Who can defeat us? You see? Who can win out over us? Who can destroy us? Who can win the battle over us? Who can stop the plan of God in our lives? It's a negative answer, isn't it? And then notice what he says. He, Oh, man, listen to this. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him, along with Christ, graciously give us all things? Man, he gave us his only son. Hey, you think back to the story in Genesis, right? And you think of Abraham and how he was called by God. Now, remember this, and you should know this as, a, as someone who knows the scriptures, that God never intended for Abraham to actually sacrifice his son, but he was testing his faith. Oh, he had wanted, him and his wife had wanted to have a son. They couldn't have a son. They had wanted it so much. They had cried over it. They had prayed over it. God had given them a promise, and God took a long time in fulfilling the promise that he gave them to even draw that out even more. And finally, they have this son, this son of promise. God says, I want you to go sacrifice him, plunge a knife into him, like you would a sacrifice animal, a lamb. I want you to sacrifice him like a lamb before me. Go make an altar and do it. The most important thing, arguably the most important thing to Abraham. And it says, in, in especially in the New Testament account where it talks about it, he had made, he raised that knife upon his, uh, over his son and he had made in his mind he had made the transaction, the faith transaction in his mind to do it. In other words, God knew he was purposing that, you know what, God? Nothing is more important than your love for me. Nothing is more important than your purpose and your plan for my life. And I'm even willing to lose my son over this. And as soon as that transaction in his heart and his mind and his will happened, God stopped. Uh, sent an angel said stopped it immediately it said abraham abraham don't hurt don't hurt your son don't hurt your son go over there man there'll be a ram in the thicket you go sacrifice uh, this lamb or the uh, ram that's over there and of course there was one in the thicket and he and he did it he was testing him oh guys look what he says he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also along with him, graciously give us all things. God, it, it, think about it. If Jesus went to the cross for us, God so loved the world that he gave his son to us, guys, to be treated the way he was treated. How can we doubt that God would give us every good thing in our lives? How can we doubt that he doesn't have, a, that his plan for our life is deficient in some way? Notice what he says, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who will bring any charge? In other words, there's a negative intended here. There's nobody, right? It is God who justifies. Remember we talked about just as if I'd never sinned? Who could condemn us? Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, Notice, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Well, guys, you know, it's very interesting to me. In the temple, when you go into the temple area, there was never any kind of a chair or a seat for the priest to rest. Nothing, no implements are mentioned in the Bible for a, a 
priest to sit down. His work was to be continuous. You, you didn't have chairs to go or a little barco lounge in the temple, you know, to take care of, of um, you know, getting rest. It was to be continuous. But it's interesting in the, in the book of, I think it's Mark, where it says that Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. Guys, he sat down because in a place of rest, because the work was finished. Do you understand? It was finished. There's no further work to be done. Once for all, he died for our sins. And so who is he that condemns? Jesus Christ, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of of God. And he's also praying for us and interceding for us. What a wonderful thing to know that. Don't you love it when you know someone, you really know someone is praying for you, you know, because you know what they're like and you know that they really do pray for you. Hey, man, isn't it? I mean, think how awesome this is. We got Jesus praying for each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. Maybe you feel like, well, I'm not important enough for him to be praying for me. (laughs) How wrong you are. How wrong you are. You're important enough to him that he would be slaughtered for your sins. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's the other thought. If he's got a plan in my life and everything works out for good, can anything come be uh, short circuit that, that whole plan? Who shall separate us? Notice from the love of Christ. Is there anything? What's the answer? Who shall separate us? No one, nothing actually. Shall trouble? How about trouble? You got some trouble in your life? We all do, huh? Trouble, hardship in our lives. You got some of that? We have people in our lives that we love and, we, and they're taken away from us and when they die and, we, and, and it's just trouble. It's hardship. But that will never separate you. No matter what you go through, no matter what you say. You know, God is a big God. <laughs> I've been very angry at God at times. I mean, it was stupid. I knew, I even knew it was stupid when I was being angry, but I was angry anyway, right? Usually we know we're, we're dumb when we act that way. But just saying, you know, saying to God, you know, just being angry and upset at his will and how he's running my life. And, you know, really it's the circumstance. I'm, I'm acting like Jacob. Everything's against me. And when we have that kind of attitude, we're really complaining about God's plan and how he's running our lives. But he says, you know what? God's big enough to take my little insults and into my, my lack of faith. He's, he's, he's big enough for that. He's not going to swat me down and squash me like a bug because I had weaknesses. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? This is what they were living with at this time of the writing here. And he quotes another passage in the Old Testament. For your sake we face death all, all, all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. That's not what our experience is. He says, no, here's the answer. Here's the answer to all those questions. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. No, in all of these things, we're more than conquerors. Well, you mean, wait, to conquer what? Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, persecution, all of the things that are going on. No, we're more than conquerors. Now, here is something I just want to say on the side level. What we have seen in the Christian church in America, oftentimes, is we are trying to conquer America. But God says we are more than conquerors. You see, to conquer America, we go after all the morals and we 
get the moral majority together and now oh, if we can just get a christian into office and we can just get all this you know the silent majority of moral people together and change all the laws and make everything the way it's supposed to be oh man that you know that's what we should be doing that's trying to be a conqueror we are called to be more than conquerors more than that it's not going to be by pol politics it's not going to be by the will of men that things improve in our nation. We are more than conquerors. Yeah, well, what, wait a second. Aren't we supposed to be salt and light in the world? Yeah. You ever, I don't know if you've ever, we played a trick once on Chewy. This is Greg again. You're coming up in my sermons a lot. We played a little friendly. It was friendly. Chewy asked for, we were having pizza, and he asked for uh the cheese, and we kept ha handing him uh, peppers. And he was pouring it. You want some more cheese? Yeah, okay, and he's pouring it out. He's blind, I'm sorry. I, this is kind of the sick person you've got here. I, I'm, I have a lot of fun with my blind friends. One time I loosened the cheese lid, and, and he went, Psh! the whole thing. I gave him another piece. I just, it was just fun. Just having a good time. Chewy doesn't mind. <laughs> Guys, that's how we try to be salt sometimes. It's like getting a, a, you know, asking for some salt in the soup that you're drinking or you're eating, and, and the guy unscrews the lid and throws the whole thing in there. It ruins it. We are to be salt, a seasoning, a way of showing people. It's, it's to be uh, light in the world, but it doesn't mean to get, you know, one of those super, you know, hot lights and stick it right in their eyeball. But we're to be in the scenes working with people on individual levels, you know, and, and leading them to Christ, showing them an example, taking every opportunity that the Spirit gives to us to love people into the kingdom of Christ. And that's when things are going to change in America, is when we see people receive Jesus Christ. But when we get up on our soapbox, as Christian as Christianity does in America oftentimes, and we get up on our soapbox and we start preaching all the morals, you know what ends up happening? Somebody, some guy that is a Christian, something in his past is going to come up. We've seen that this week, matter of fact, with the Duggars family. The world's going to find something on you, you know, and then they're going to distort that into what they're saying. Bunch of hypocrites. Bunch of hypocrites. Look at them. They don't like our sexuality in America. Yeah, but look at them. This guy molested, you know, or did whatever he did. We're more than conquerors, guys. Through Christ Jesus who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future. Look, at those are opposite poles, you understand? He's trying to tell you that there is no circumstance in life that this does not cover, or does cover. It, well, how did I say that? I didn't say it right. There is no circumstance in life that this promise does not cover, okay? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor any height, nor any depth, nor anything else in creation. Okay, thank you, Paul. I think we got it. Notice what here, here's what it is. We'll be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Guys, if that doesn't thrill you, I don't know what else could thrill you. That in our life, no matter what, guys, we should live with joy. We should live in worship. We should live in such a great appreciation and enjoy the ride that we're on, man. We're like riding the waves, you know. I've never surfed as obvious. I couldn't even get up on the board if I wanted to. But I think of it like surfing. We're on a, we're on, we caught a wave, man. God's got us up on a wave. Enjoy the ride. Don't be afraid about it. Don't freak out about it. Don't get negative about it. It's a good ride. 
Oh, there'll be there'll be times. There'll be times where it's troublous, where it, woo, you know, kind of scary. What's going to happen next? But don't fail in your faith. Realize your faith is in the God who gave his own son for you. And because of that and on that basis, man, will he not give you every good thing? You know he will, right? Oh, guys, be positive about your life. Become a, a Pied Piper for people because people are, are so desiring to be around. Uh, people in this world are so desiring to be around Christians that are solid in the Lord, that don't go around pouring out the salt in their soup, but are there to season, to be that seasoning, to show them what life is really all about. And what a savior is all about. People that are positive about life, not just grumps about everything and negative. He wants you to live life abundantly and, and he means to the fullest. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you so much for loving us, giving us your word. Oh, Lord, I can't think of... <laughs> I can't think of anything better than what we just absorbed. Oh, Lord, just to be with you, to have your goodwill in our lives is more than what we could ask. Oh, Lord, forgive us for being like Jacob's, like Jacob was, Lord, in our lives over our troubles, being miserable, being scornful. giving the appearance to others that our God is not a good God, that his will for us is not a good will, that our following him is not a good decision. That's the vibe we give off when we're not in this place of promise that all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Help us to live in hope. Help us to rejoice in you. I pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. After we're going to do a song, I want you all to stand up. Come on, stand up. After church, I would love to be praying with someone here. If you would like to know Jesus Christ, don't hesitate to come forward. I want to pray with you and introduce you to Jesus Christ. And, and uh, he would just love and desire to come into your life. So let's pray that, uh, let's go ahead and sing this song together and rejoice in the Lord. And then afterwards, we're going to have prayer. God bless. <laughs>